that you've talked a lot about, um, you know, costs and and uh, mental health and, and many other important things. But I want to talk to you about human trafficking. Um, last month was Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and I'm sure, as you're aware, um, I have Senate Bill 60, which is the Buyer Beware Act. And that legislation uh, would essentially double the maximum jail sentence for an individual convicted of trafficking or patronizing a victim of trafficking. And I have to note that our state victim advocate is here in the audience, Jennifer Storm, and she was very helpful in, in drafting that legislation. So uh, additionally, um, it would increase uh, the fines for those who are convicted, uh, especially for those who um, traffic or patronize a trafficked minor. So there was a story last summer with the headline, Modern Slavery, How We Expose Deadly Sex Trafficking in U.S. Prisons. And that story highlighted a documentary that exposed the pattern of grooming and recruitment of women prisoners by pimps and sex buyers in the United States. And it, the story covered how traffickers would send money um, to people, women who are incarcerated, put it in their bank account so um, they would also send them letters. And one female inmate said in this documentary that a letter from the outside was like a gift from God. So um, they would really make women prisoners feel wanted and appreciated. And the documentary followed former inmates from Massachusetts who were, and I quote, cycled out of jail and immediately back into a life of addiction and exploitation at the hands of pimps and sex buyers. So um, while my legislation goes after those who traffic and who purchase the services of trafficked victims, um, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what what you see here in Pennsylvania, what your department is doing to ensure that if and when inmates are released, they aren't trafficked. And if you have the tools that you need to um, help identify and combat this issue in Pennsylvania's prisons. So um, I actually was on a panel at Villanova with the two ladies in that documentary. And um, you know, I watched the documentary and I gotta tell you, it was one of the more embarrassing moments because it was not on my radar scope at all. And the notion that someone could be trafficked from inside a jail or prison, I hadn't, in 29 years in this field, I hadn't thought about it one time. <clears throat> so we um, put together an intelligence briefing, which I believe we shared with you. If, if not, I, ho I hope it's on its way. Uh, <laughs> checks in the mail. Um, <laughs> to look at just kind of in general about human trafficking. We're meeting with, I believe it's Shea Rhodes from Villanova mm -hmm. Law School. Um, actually later this, no, March, in March, to look specifically about what the best practices are in corrections. And, and it's our intent to understand uh, what we should be doing to identify, like I've spent most of my career working at the jail level. Not, I'm not familiar with one jail that would ask somebody upon commitment if they were being trafficked, for instance, which doesn't seem like a high bar. So we're gonna really just try to understand um, what we should be doing and then hopefully work with the counties and try to provide technical assistance and help us um, at least get a sense of what's going on. Um, so I, embarrassingly, we're not doing much, but that will change uh, very soon. Well, and I really appreciate that because I certainly think that we need to ensure that people aren't being exploited while they're incarcerated. And then I think it's also important that we inoculate people who are incarcerated so that we can assure that they don't become victimized again and, and wind up back into that, that cycle. So um, I look forward to the report and I, if there are things that we can do as we move um, the Buyer Beware Act through the legislature, please would welcome uh, the opportunity to work with you and, and make that a better piece of legislation. Um, just briefly, and, and you talked uh, Senator Baker asked questions about the overtime issues, and, and overtime continues, and, and we understand that um, the transition from Greaterford to Phoenix it, it raised some of those costs, but uh, a legislative budget and finance committee report found that it costs taxpayers more to pay a corrections officer overtime than if the department were to train, equip, and hire a new corrections officer. So. Um, if you could, could you talk about the steps you're taking to right-size the department, understanding that um, the good news is our prison population is beginning to decline, um, yet we're still facing some of those overtime costs year after year, and what tools um, this body can, can provide to allow you to reduce 
your overall overtime figure? Yeah, so I, I think just to kind of contextualize this, and I'll be as brief as I can, Chairman, so I'm getting a look here. Um, our overtime, if you look at the hours of overtime, uh, we're, it's re been reduced by about 400,000 hours over the last four years. But one of the challenges is that overtime, when you take the hours, you got to multiply it by increases in salary. So we're never comparing apples to apples year to year, right? So, um, but we're really focusing on the hours. And some overtime uh, is appropriate. Like, for instance, if we have someone uh, on an emergency basis that gets sent out to the hospital, we don't want uh, two officers plus a chase car sitting around waiting for someone to get sent out to the hospital. So what makes sense for overtime to be used is, is an intermittent, unplanned uh, circumstance. I think the other thing that you have to factor in is the amount of leave time. Um, so our overtime budget, our overall personnel expenses are about $2 billion, and overtime represents $100 million of that. Um, so again, just to contextualize, it's about a half percent, if, if I'm doing my math correct. Thank you.